addressing whatever question or thought. So feel free to interrupt or interject at any point. Um, we let me talk for just a minute about uh, a couple of things. You know, as you guys know, COVID has kind of made running elections more difficult, more time consuming, and I know you guys know that well because you're dealing with it and trying to help voters get registered. Um, we're making an extra effort this year, I think a lot like you are, to make sure that um, we communicate about voter registration and that we make it easier than ever for people to do that. I uh, just got through with an interview with, uh, with WIBW talking about the reasons to register. You know, most of the reasons for provisional ballots actually relate to either an inaccuracy or a failure to register. So, I've really been talking about that, that if you want to help yourself, help your neighbor, not deal with provisionals, um, that first of all, remember the provisional process is a safety net process. It's designed to preserve that right for someone's ballot to count. So it's actually not a punitive process. It's really an, our attempt to make sure that if it can count, it does count. But reminding people that register by the 13th and you'll save yourself a lot of extra time and issues and question marks if you'll check your registration most of the most of the issues with provisionals relate to incorrect registration or showing up at the polling place so in an effort to try to make sure that um, people fully understand their options can check their registrations we kind of put together our 2020 voting options page where we kind of lay out, because I'm always surprised at the number of people that tell me they didn't really understand that there were three different ways to vote. So we've really tried to emphasize that in the mailings that have gone out this year, as well as our website and the link that we're promoting. Making sure people know you can vote by mail. And then we've got a link on this website that you've got up there uh, to, sh to help you get in there and get that app filled out. And then also to track it off of the the Secretary of State's website, we've got links to help you track it through the entire process to make sure that you know that we got your app, that your ballot has been sent to you, and you can track it all the way through that it's been received and accepted at the election office. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive tracking system the Secretary of State's office has set up, and we're trying to help people come to the voting options page to sort of track and follow that process for security purposes as much as anything, just to make sure we're all communicating clearly about where is your mail ballot in the process and did it get here in time or not. Additionally, we know that people have concerns about the post office. So late this week, maybe early next week, it just depends on how much time we get to finalize everything. We are expecting to announce publicly the locations, times, dates, all that stuff of drop boxes. And because we just got the drop boxes, we're scrambling a little bit to try to uh, build a process that gives enough people as much access as we can. And since we only got two, we ordered them through the Secretary of State's office, but they were a while getting here and we really couldn't find any more at the time we were looking. So we've got two, but we've decided to go mobile with these boxes and we're still trying to finalize it, but within a week or so, we should have those posted on the website as well as the time, locations, and date. I would expect as many as 10 locations across the county uh, to be available. So I really want to emphasize this website because I think it's also a good way for people to track times, locations, dates of those uh, mobile drop boxes that'll be all over the place too. So uh, expect to hear more of that, more about that either the end of the week or the first of next week, depending on how many other things we get done. Uh, I'm actually building out two trailers We'll have a Shawnee County Election Office logo on the side of it, uh, and those trailers will have the two boxes, and then we're going to have uh, employees that are actually at designated locations across the county. Part of the challenge I've got right now is figuring out exactly where to place those so that we don't create unnecessary traffic jams. So we're working through that right now. Um, other website features on this 2020 voting options page, um, we also try to address hours of operation and the days that were open for early voting and that it's open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. here at the office. Um, 
You know, it's what's extremely challenging this year is trying to figure out where to put resources because I honestly do not know how many people are going to end up voting by mail, how many are going to vote early in the office, how many are going to vote on election day at the polling place. And so we're doing the best we can to project and model that out. But, you know, if for some reason the mail ballot doesn't develop as, you know, we're over, we're over 20,000 requests for ballots already. We're getting about 300 a day. So we're probably over 21,000 as of today. So at the current trajectory, we're, I would say that we're initial mailing is probably going to be close to 24, 25,000 on the 14th when all those ballots go out. So I don't know how many more we'll get after that. Those uh, advanced ballots take a lot more staff time to process getting them out and getting them back in and processed correctly. So those, there's an extra expense for the office there, which is fine. That's what the law requires. I'm happy to do it. It's just trying to anticipate and coordinate the people that you need when you need them is a little bit of a challenge. And uh, so we're working on that, but I think we're in pretty good shape on that. And then additionally, trying to figure out, you know, are we going to have a light crowd or a super heavy crowd on election day at the polling places? Also, kind of hard to project at this point. So we're doing the best we can with it. Um, I will say this, due to social distancing in the office on election day, we're not going to have the actual capacity that we used to have because we're gonna be spacing people out more. So I will expect to see a little more lines probably than we're used to, just because you know only so many people can be uh, in the building at a time and only so many people can be uh, um, basically in that space. So lines, uh, a little bit of lines here and there would not surprise me. I don't think we'll be in too bad a shape because we've really fought for a long time uh, to make sure that we don't, a lot of our, our bigger counties have three and 4,000 people assigned to some of their precincts. And we've really tried to avoid that because that's just almost certainly gonna be a line so we're pretty proud of the fact that we've got a lot of polling places and we've got fairly low numbers compared to larger counties that are like us uh, in that regard. So we feel decent about it. Uh, the other challenge that we're having in preparing for uh, election day, I would say we've lost probably two or two to 300 of our longtime workers who are just, con because they're in that demographic, they're concerned about the virus. So I'm not going to have as much experienced uh, people at each polling place as I would like. We're still over half, so we're okay. Um, but I'm always, you know, a little concerned when I've got to rely on training uh, as much as I do on just experienced people helping one or two people at a polling place. So we'll have a we'll have to pay real close attention on election day to our to our volunteers because you know, a large chunk of them will be brand new or, or relatively new, may have worked that primary election. So those are some of the things that we're working on. Those are some of the challenges. Um, like I said, I continue to push out information, encouraging people to avoid a provisional by registering. Uh, the 13th, I think, is the big date looming. I believe that we are doing a voter registration drive at the library again this next weekend. Um, and those have been those have been good because people can not only check and register, but they can also check the exact you know details of their current registration because we also keep our electronic poll books handy with the entire voter database in it, so we can quickly look up uh, you know what somebody's uh, exact details are. So I think people have appreciated that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. You know, the, the county has purchased quite a bit of, of equipment for us in the last two or three months, and we're actually going to be going on the agenda on Thursday again for uh, a high-speed scanner and a couple of other fairly expensive pieces of equipment. We hope that that scanner uh, will allow us to process mail ballots more efficiently and quicker so that we can scan in those um, signatures on those ballots and actually have a percentage of comparison um, number. So the, for the ones that are at 95 to 98 percent, you know, we may be able to process half of our mail ballots quicker on that signature side for those that are very, very similar. And then the ones that are slightly different, we'll spend a little more time on. But it, 
we're hoping that that cuts down on our staff time as well. So we're trying to find some efficiencies uh, through this as well. Um, we're also, I believe, on the on the going to be purchasing another uh, another ballot tabulation device for those mail ballots to make sure we've got plenty of capacity there. So, number of changes. Um, but I also will tell you, thanks to the league, and I've agreed with you guys, we've got a paper-based system. I think that's important. You guys thought it was important, but I'm really happy overall with the system that we have here and the way it works. I think it um, is probably as efficient as anything out there and still accomplishes that paper-based, provable. Um, you know, if you ever had a question, you could always have Republicans and Democrats as a, as a group go back in as an appointed board and just verify that the paper matches what uh, election night numbers are saying. So. I feel pretty good about that. Um, the other thing I think you, you might want to pay attention to, just to check, can everybody still hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm not just talking to myself here. Um, the other thing to remember is, you know, we've still all got all the security in place. We've got cameras everywhere in the office. We've got passwords on everything. Our machines are never hooked up to the internet. Even the election night computer has no connections to the internet whatsoever. So we feel pretty good about the security measures that we're taking in those regards. Um, there was another point I was gonna make and I can't think of what it was, but um, suffice it to, oh, I know what it was. Just the thing that's gonna be a little different for people and you should know this and anticipate this, you know, because the law changed back in 17, I don't think people fully appreciate that this is what you're hearing a lot of noise about from, from a number of people about why mail ballots could take a little longer. I don't think it'll be bad here. I think we'll be fine. But the law was changed to say that you, if you dropped your ballot in the mail and had it postmark election day, you know, it's going to take two to three days to get to us. And so the law now allows for that ballot to count, even if it shows up on Friday. So what we plan to do is to report all of the mail ballot numbers from Wednesday's mail Wednesday at 5 p.m. All of the numbers from Thursday's mail, Thursday at 5 p.m. And all of the numbers from Friday at 5 p.m. on Friday. So if you'll check uh, our website, we're gonna update that every day through Friday with those numbers. So that will actually give you a better sense. And again, I have no idea how many people are gonna drop their ballots in late. There's just no, no way for me to know or even guess that effectively. It could be thousands, it could just be hundreds, I don't know. Um, I certainly hope it's not tens of thousands because that would be more difficult. Um, it just takes a certain amount of time to process those. And when you get into those kinds of numbers, then it, then it probably would be a lot of late hours on Wednesday and Thursday, making sure we have it all done by Friday. So either way, our plan is to have all of those mail ballot numbers finalized and uploaded to the public to view on Friday. So in a sense, it is possible that your election day numbers really aren't going to be known until Friday, depending on how much that may or may not change some of those races. Additionally, of course, provisionals then will be the thing that we work in work on for almost two weeks uh, before we go back before we go back to the canvas. And that canvas 13 days later is where the county commission makes the decisions as to uh, which provisionals count and which one don't based upon the county counselor and my analysis of the facts and of what the law requires. So we really aren't sitting around trying to determine how do I feel about this or how do I feel about that on a provisional. We try to make it count. We always contact the voter. We let them know what their options and what the situation is and encourage them to take all the steps that they can to make it count if humanly possible. So. We usually get to uh, the canvas with well over 50% of those ballots counting. So even that one to 2% that are provisional, the majority of those actually end up counting. And we find that the majority of the ones that don't count usually tend to be people that never registered. So at some level, I think it's safe to say that the system is working uh, because, um, you know, it's a safety net process. And I believe that we're helping a number of those people make sure their vote gets counted. And for those that don't get counted, 
there really is no way under the law for us to do anything about that. If they don't register, if they're not catching uh, and don't understand the law, despite all the work that I know many people are doing, there isn't much we can do about it uh, once it gets to that point. So that's just a little, uh, I guess, conversation about how the back end and then that final analysis for the numbers typically works. I will... Uh, I will stop for a minute and see if you guys have any questions or any piece of what I've talked about or anything different you want me to cover. Um, that's just a real quick overview of kind of what we've been doing and what we expect to do. Any questions, comments, thoughts, I'm happy to visit about uh, anything else that you would want to visit about. Um, let's see, I see um, Camille has her hand up. You're on mute, Camille. Okay, you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so um, I was wondering uh, the next legislative session whether you would be supportive of a uh, permanent application for voting by mail rather than as it is now, people have to do it prior to each election. You know, um, <laughs> having been in the legislature for 10 years, um, I'm hesitant to get too opinionated about um, legislation. I've actually kind of tried to take the position the last three or four years of just focusing on dealing with what the statutes are and just executing. I worry a little bit, since my job is administrative, I worry a little bit, especially in this environment, to be honest with you. Uh, I worry a little bit about getting too aggressive and having too many opinions. I'm okay with saying a few things along, but um, I would kind of have to qualify that by saying it just depended on a lot of facts around it. I would want to check with the secretary and make sure it was okay with them. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm to be honest with you, I'm kind of playing it safe on that front right now because very, people are very divided. And I feel like it's my job to try to chart a course through the middle of most of this stuff and I worry a little bit if I come out and make too many statements on any particular thing that I get to be seen as that guy who has an agenda. So I'm really trying to just stick to what the law says, stick to making sure we execute it perfectly and that we're as helpful to the public in that environment as we can be. So that's probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but but the reality is that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. But check with me next year and we'll see. Maybe the environment will be different. I don't know. So it do just you seems... think, would, would we be better served contacting the Secretary of State about this issue? Um, maybe um, be more... Does, yeah, I would say he does seem to want to weigh in uh, on some things, but then he also kind of leaves it to the legislature to, to work their own will too. So I would certainly check with him. And okay. if at some point he's begging me to come in and have big opinions on it, then I'll have to at least think about it seriously. I just, I'm real hesitant to though, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, at least well, who knew voting by things. mail would be a hot political issue, you know? So <laughs> I don't understand that. Well, and you'll notice, I make no apologies for talking about it publicly, even though, you know, I've got a few Republicans on occasion that aren't real happy with me for talking about it. But I'm like, look, guys, here's the deal. The law hmm. says it's an option, and I'm going to call it an option because that's what it is, and I'm going to talk about it. So, hmm. you know. I, I get an I don't get a lot of pushback, but I get an occasional person or two who gives me their full opinion on why mail ballots are bad. And so, you know, I just try to chart a course through the middle, quite frankly, that respects everybody's opinion the best that I can, um, follows the law to the extent that I, you know, know it and understand it and can. And that's, as you can imagine, this environment, that's a kind of a tricky thing to do right now. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I wondered if you would talk just a minute about um, uh, those individuals who maybe have made a request to vote by mail and then decide that um, they want to vote in person, whether it's early or at the polls. Um, 
basically the way the law works you would have to if you've already turned it in um you would have to yeah if we've already mailed it out and they're sitting on it we really you can do it you can vote another way but then it becomes provisional because we have to make sure that we know that only one of them got counted and with election workers with only three hours of training (laughs) you know if one got in that shouldn't have somehow then the other one's still captured in a provisional envelope. So that's really part of the theory behind why that pretty much is a provisional. And even the state database system is, is kind of tricky to back out once you've mailed one out. It's kind of tricky to, to do that. So pretty much, pretty much if you've requested a mail ballot and received it, you would need to vote provisionally. You can do it. You can come in the office and vote, or you can vote at your polling place, but it has to be a provisional. It's kind of how that works. So at at Canvas, um, are there systems in place that would um, tell the uh, Board of Canvassers that they can count this provisional ballot because no mail ballot was returned? Yeah, um, the way that works is, you know, we put all of the ballots that are alike. We really try not to call any one person out. And so we'll have stacks of 20 or 30 or 40 that are alike. Uh, And there'll be a stack of say 30 that will be, um, I think the issue is, you know, voted only once. There's a statute that says you can only vote once. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we explain to them, we recommend this stack to count because we verify there's only one vote. And when this counts, that'll be their one vote. And then there's another set we recommend not to count because their vote already got in some other way. So yeah, there's a process and we do it by grouping or by category so that we're not calling each person out by name or unnecessarily bringing attention to privacy issues related to that. I see. Um, I see that Sharon has her hand up here. Yeah, I have a question. I really appreciate everything you've done on the mailing mailing ballots and the 10 mobile drop boxes. That's great news. Um, I did, my son lives in Wichita and I, and he said that, and I see it on their website, they have 10 early voting locations. How are they able to do that? I know they're much bigger than we are, but uh, that is, you know, how are they able to do that? Um, part of what's happened in Wichita is, at one, and they may be up from this, but at one point for an entire town that's, you know, three, three times the size and much more geographically spread out than Topeka, they only had 60 polling places. And so they got very aggressive with early voting and they mailed out applications to every voter, every election to try to mitigate for lines at their polling places because compared to us, they would have had to have had 300 polling places. They only had 60. (laughs) So, So really it was a strategy on their part to try to mitigate for the fact that they didn't have near enough polling places. Um, so it's a challenge. Uh, she, you know, I've talked to her at length about that, and it is not a fun or easy reconciliation process to verify your numbers every day. It's it's a monster, uh, and I'm sure it's expensive in its own way. But they they do run a lot of them. Even Johnson County, I think, only has seven, and they're you know like five times bigger than us. So oh my gosh. that's a lot. She really, she really needs a lot more polling places over there, but I think she has a lot of trouble finding them and getting them. And so that's kind of a mitigation strategy that they've embarked on over there. That makes sense. She's, they've opened up the Intrust Bank Arena for, <laughs> for like starting the 19th from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. So that's, you know, that's incredible, but now it makes sense because they didn't have enough polling places. Yeah, um, we've talked about the Expo Center. Uh, We've talked about it, but it takes a lot of expense to set up because you're required to have a hard wire dedicated only for elections at any location. So money-wise, we haven't wanted to do it. And at least so far, we've not really had much trouble getting people processed quickly here at the one in Shawnee County. so we've, we've considered other options. It just hasn't made enough sense yet. And that's why we try to stay open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Also, we found that we used to do 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., but we found that very, very few people came in that last hour. And so we just kind of went back to doing 7 p.m. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other question, uh, Commissioner, that the league has um, has had um, is uh, because we're in a pandemic, uh, and I kind of like your reference to being in the demographic rather than to be in an old person. Uh, but um, you know, because of the pandemic, numerous driver's licenses statewide have not been renewed on time. So if you go to the polls, um, will an expired driver's license be an acceptable form of ID? For any yeah, I think I, part of what I expect to do in training is just to say, look, if someone is 65, you know, that's normally the point at which they don't have to have a current driver's license. I'm going to say, look, if they're 64, that's good enough for this election because it's too difficult to nail down precisely when they could or could not have gotten it updated. So I'm going to run that by our legal counsel, but that's kind of where I think I'm headed with just trying to make sure we handle that through training and saying for this election, 64 is going to be adequate instead of 65. Does that make any sense? Um, it does. It does. Um, you know, I think that that's a little bit different answer than we've uh, received. Well, and, and, and you're right. Um, I guess the other answer is if somebody's got a driver's license that's expired during any time March or something, yeah, then, then that's so if you can tell when that's expired, then that's the other the other piece of it as well. Yeah. No, we're going to have to train on that in board school because it's going to be a little bit of a kind of different thing to deal with. But Well, and the way I understand the emergency order of the governor's office, it makes it a little bit of a moving target, too. Yeah, I, that's another one of those things that's on my list to have a conversation with the county counselor because I think we're going to have to know what the county strategy is. And it's a little messy. I'll agree with you. It's a little messy to know for sure. So my guess is we'll go back to the beginning of the year somewhere and declare, you know, if anywhere from, Jan I'm just guessing, I'll have to check with the legal on this, but I'm guessing somewhere around January, you know, if, if you haven't been able to renew this year, but you were good prior to that, my guess is we're going to call it good enough. But the county counselor's pretty pretty understanding of that stuff and he and I've talked about it we just need to make a final decision because I've got to start teaching class here pretty quick yeah so. so other other questions for the grace unmute yourself okay um I'm a little confused about this mobile drop box thing I just assumed there would be two permanent drop boxes and that every any day I decided to go I could drop my ballot so I'm yeah. concerned about how people are going to know which day they're where. Right. Um, part of the part of the challenge for us is making sure that we don't just have one here at the office and tell people if you're 20 miles away, you got to drive in. So we're trying to make sure that we kind of cover both ends. I expect to have one box either probably not in the parking lot at the election office, but are in the in the general vicinity or not far away. Okay. That and then great. I will probably have another one kind of making some rounds out in the more rural or even further out in other parts of the county and the, and the city too. That's kind of my general concept uh, because I've only got two boxes and I wish I had a lot more. We're trying to be as efficient with we can and communicate the best that we can, but we had difficulty getting boxes. And uh, so we're trying to really make sure that we're getting our money's worth out of those two. I'm glad there's going to be one that will be the same place every day. That sounds yeah, great. that that was either the same place. What I haven't decided is, I think what we may do, and I'm still trying to figure out the best way to do it. We may do like an, you know, 8 a.m. to every day from 8 a.m. to a certain time, it'll be here at the office. And then I may have them for that last three or four hours of the day, go out to different parts of, the t of town too. So. It won't be perfect, but um, making sure that for those that really want to use that option, you know, the information will be out there and we'll be talking to the media about it a lot. And I'm sure you guys will help us get the message out and it'll be on our website. So I know it won't be perfect, but um, again, for those that are really working at finding it, we'll make sure they can get it handled. Even if they just call us, we'll make sure they can, can get to the nearest location. Camille? Uh, unmute yourself. 
How much, how much do those drop boxes cost? Honestly, uh, I don't know because the Secretary of State's office actually paid for those two and we said we want them and they didn't actually bill us. They just used federal grant money. So I actually don't know. Yes. The bigger issue to me with the boxes isn't so much the price tag of the boxes. It's the security. How do you monitor them with cameras? How do you make sure that they're accessible to enough people outside the center of town? I mean, there's it's complex and then you really end up you end up spending a lot of staff time running around dealing with the same kinds of issues anyway uh and then um so security is probably the thing that worries me the most yeah if one of them got broke into or somebody wrapped a chain around it and drug it down the street i mean that stuff that's the kind of question marks that keep me awake at night these boxes, I like the security features that they have, and I like having a Republican and a Democrat with their own key, and it takes a Republican and a Democrat to open the box because the top lock on the door is the, is the Republican one, and the bottom one's the Democrat one, and so they have to do it as a team to get it open. They're not allowed to open it until they get it back here to the office at night, and then we're going to have a whole security process for how it gets processed back here. I feel better about knowing that they're under election office employee, you know, handling and care <clears throat> the entire time. And I'll tell you the other big benefit of this that I think we will see. I want the people that are helping people get these ballots in these drop boxes to help people make sure they're signed, to make sure that they got the information on the, in the correct envelope. I worry that people will drop just a, a, an empty ballot without an envelope in there, that kind of stuff because a lot of these people have not done this before. And I think we're gonna save ourselves a lot of manpower, time and effort dealing with provisionals if we can help them at the drop box, make sure that those issues are handled timely and that it gets to count because, oh yeah, you're right, I forgot to sign it. Or, oh, I didn't know it had to be in the envelope, that kind of stuff. So yes. I really think we're probably saving the county money because as you know, the law requires, and we've always done it, but the law requires us to call people and attempt to help them cure any issues with their provisionals before the canvas event. So that takes a lot of manpower, and a lot of time. And sometimes it's hard to get phone numbers or to find people. So if you can catch them when they're dropping the mail ballot off and make sure they've helped themselves get those issues handled real time, I really think that's a big savings in the long run on reduction of, in, of, of, mail, of uh, provisionals and just customer service. So I guess that's there's going to be, of... there's going to be a human being by the drop box to deal with these issues. Yes. No, that's my plan. That's oh, part of, that's oh. part of why I like the mobile approach is you've got a Republican and Democrat sitting there just helping people answering questions, Okay. helping them with, you know, Hey, make sure it's signed, make sure your ballot's in your envelope, make sure it's sealed, that kind of stuff. Okay, yep. good. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think that's great. So I'm, I'm trying to look around here and um, see where our questions are. So. <laughs> okay. Um, Donna, Donna has one. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. Do we have the same number of polling places uh, this time as we have in the past? And do you anticipate any shortage of poll workers with the uh, COVID pandemic? Um, I'm not anticipating a shortage right now. Like I said, we're a little bit down on experience, which concerns me a little bit, but we're not in terrible shape. I mean, I've, I've read horror stories from other states and we're okay, we're not in trouble. Um, I'd like to have a few more experienced people, but it is what it is. I think our numbers will be fine. I think we'll have enough people at each polling place. Uh, we're getting ready to send our, our letter out in the next day or so to all of our election workers. And we have well over 700 and we're gonna continue to add people. So I think we're okay in that regard. Um, our polling place numbers, I believe, are going to be exactly the same as they were in the primary. We lost four nursing homes, which is not too shocking. Uh, I think we had two or three changes of churches, but every election I lose a couple or three. So 
you know, we're like, we're off by 4% of what we've ever been. So we're, we're still right in there with where we normally are, all things considered. And especially considering COVID, a lot of places lost a lot of locations. The only ones that we truly lost were nursing homes where they just couldn't let us in. And there was nothing they could do about it, nothing we could do about it. So I feel good about that here. I really do. And I do, if I could, ask a follow-up on polling places. Um, we've heard some threats in social media and from some of the leaders of our nation that there will be people watching. What are the rules for where people can be outside or inside the polling place talking to voters? I thought the Secretary of State's office did a real good job here in the last couple of days handling those kinds of questions because they kind of let people know you really have to be a, a, an appointed poll watcher and you have to be appointed uh, by your party or by a candidate and there's only one per polling place so you really can't just hang out of the polling place and watch. You can go there and you can stand in line, you can vote, but you can't just hang out there. So if we get people who insist on doing that, the judge is going to say, hey, here's what the law says. You have to go. You can't, you know, you can't just hang out here. Um, and I'm going to have statutes ready to hand them so that people don't think we're just making it up. I mean, these are all statute driven statements. They're not just made up theories. Um, and at the end of the day, if we need to ask the sheriff or the police department to come out and have a conversation with people, then that's what we'll do. Uh, because at the end of the day, people have to also not engage in conversations about elections considered electioneering within 250 feet of the entrance to a polling place. So no signs, no shirts, no, no red hats, no nothing, no, no Biden shirts, none of that can occur at the polling place or within 250 feet of the entrance to a polling place. So I, I have no doubt that there's going to be half a dozen places someone's going to wear a red hat or wear a shirt for one candidate or the other, and that will have to be removed. And we are very clear on that in class that that is considered electioneering and is not permitted. And if it, and if it gets ugly, we'll call law enforcement and let them figure sort it out. So I'm not terribly worried about it, uh, but we will address it in training. And if it occurs, I will personally go out to the polling place if I have to and address it. So um, I actually, believe it or not, my perception so far is, um, and, and, I will, and, I'll, and I'll caveat this, I don't watch a lot of television, so I'm sure I'm missing some things, but listening to people so far who are talking to me, I'm not getting the fear level that we saw in 2016. I think people were genuinely frightened in 16 of what was going to happen on election day. Now, it may be getting to that point. I don't know. I'm not telling you I'm plugged in perfectly. I haven't heard as much concern yet this, this time as I did in 16. Um, but it, I guess we've got another month to go, so who knows? Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the other question, about 28 days to be exact. <laughs> The, the other uh, the other question that um, I think a couple of people have really had is if you're expecting a mail ballot and you don't get it, what are your options and what's the time frame? Because the um, mail ballot, if if I I've made an application, I made it months ago now, um, and uh, it it actually was acknowledged on the part of the election office because I emailed it. Uh, and it is in voter view. So I'm expecting to get that ballot sometime between like the 14th and the 19th. Uh, so if I don't have it by the 20th, what should I do? Yeah, I'd say after four or five days, I would make a phone call uh, and or an email or however you want to contact us and we'll, we'll dig into it. Um, it does happen. I mean, it's fairly rare, but on occasion something doesn't get delivered. So, you know, it, it can happen. Um, I call the office. I mean, that's, the, that's the, the next step and we will get another ballot out to you. It does happen. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's, I guess that's the, that's the risk with mail is that there is a chance that it might not get to you. And if it doesn't call us and we'll try to take care of it. Uh, watch your time frames on that stuff though. I mean, like you said, if you don't get it within four or five days, call quickly because it's going to take us another couple of days to get it to you. And then you got another couple of days to get it back and the clock's still ticking. So 
So watching that and watching that voter view site to make sure you can verify where it's at is also another way to sort of track where it's at. But after four days at any one position, call us and we'll figure out what's up. Well, and um, so the, the league should really encourage, you know, don't wait too many days after the 19th or 20th of October to make that phone call because if you wait until the 28th of October, right then you've probably, you've waited too long? Well, you can always come in the office and vote provisional. And if it's the only one that comes through, you'll be fine. So there are, there are ways, I mean, there are ways to get there. It just takes a little more effort if you don't do it early. You know, it's a few more hoops to jump through and a few more things. There's still ways to get there, but yes, you don't want to wait till the 28th. Uh, I would say the 20th is a great time. That's pretty much like the fifth, day so i would by the fifth day uh i would be making phone calls if it were me for sure yeah as a general rule if you don't get it within five days of the day that we mailed it out if you can figure out when that is then yeah and i would check that voter view site to figure out when we mailed it out because it should be it should be in there fairly accurately actually so evelyn had a question and you can unmute yourself well, along that line, I was just thinking if that ballot goes to someone else instead of the person it's addressed to, and that happens sometimes, you know, you get a neighbor's mail or they get yours. Um, if someone else were to vote your ballot and then you made a provisional, now it looks like you voted twice. How do you, you know, handle that? And I realize there's a signature, but if they were coming close enough to your signature, that it would be hard to tell, how would you sort that out? Um, first of all, I would, we, we pay pretty close attention when people say I didn't get my ballot. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times um, we're already in communication with the voter and I really, I'll just say this, there's every election, there's one or two mail ballots that I have serious questions about, but I have never seen 50 or 100 or 200 that I have serious questions about. There's always at least one though, which is interesting to me, that there's always one that I'm like, boy, I just don't think that's a valid ballot. Um, so it's not a big number, it's not a significant occurrence, but most of the time we can tell what's going on because someone will call us and say, hey, I didn't get my ballot. And we're like, what do you mean? We already got a ballot in here. And that, I don't, I really, that rarely, ha I can't think of when that last happens, but it may have happened eight years ago. It might've, it probably did somewhere along the way. Um, but usually it's from someone calling us saying, hey, it's been six days. And we're like, what are you talking about? I mean, we would know that we'd gotten it back at some mm -hmm. point. Okay. So really well, I just wouldn't want anybody to be charged with voting twice right. if someone, you know, accidentally or on purpose, I'm sure it'd be on purpose, uh, send in a ballot that they happen to fall heir to. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, a challenging, uh, it's a challenging environment, but there are a lot more safeguards in place than most people realize. We can right. always tell. We've got our own unique identifiers on each ballot, so we can tell if it's ours or not. Um, we, you know, have very specific labels that we send out. And so we're looking for that exact label to come back in the exact way that we send it out. We're looking very closely at a number of signatures. So that's another way. And if there's a question mark or for any reason, something doesn't seem right, we'll just pick up the phone and call people mm -hmm. okay. to try to get a sense. Because what's fascinating to me is how straightforward and pretty straight up most people are when you call them and ask them about it. They'll tell you what they're up to. And I mean, they really are, people are pretty trustable and believable and straightforward on this stuff, which I don't know. I think it kind of surprised me a little bit, but I really have come to trust what most people say when you ask them about it, because 99% of the time they're telling you how it really is. That's what, it's what I, it checks out. We, we do all the research. We like, okay, are they telling us straight up stuff? 99% of the time they're telling it like it is. So, so our best tool is to communicate with the voter. And so calling us when you find that to be the case is by far the best way to help us figure out what's up and how did it happen and why. Okay. I hope I that's just, helpful. That's very helpful. 
And I just wanted to thank you for sending out that postcard, that informative postcard. It was very clear, it was very detailed. I mean, anybody don't understand that, they got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's challenging to understand it, but we really tried to keep it straightforward as best we could using all the different tools. So I appreciate hearing that. I think Grace has a question. Okay. Um, in Johnson County, the League of Women Voters uh, has volunteered to work in shifts before the election to open and flatten ballot. And I, I'm hearing that you're working really long hours at your office. Is there any chance, <laughs> they do it in teams, a Republican and a Democrat. Is there any chance that you would want help with all these ballots yeah, that, before the actually, election? I was actually gonna mention that. We're actually looking for people to help this week. I actually, probably my biggest need for help in the office is this week, getting those envelopes ready, getting those inner and outer envelopes stuffed. And we're, we're, we've got machines now that will insert the ballots, but getting those other envelopes inserted, I really do need help with that this week. So if anybody has time and is interested at all, call us, send me an email, let me know. We will get you plugged into some long hours real fast. Um, and uh, what about the, like the week before the election? Would you want help opening and flattening the ones that come in? Basically, um, we probably will need some of that as well. I just, you know, the way it works around here is you manage the fire and the emergency you have at the moment before you worry about the one two weeks away. And and the one the fire I've got burning at the moment is just making sure we get them all ready to go. And, you know, we get all 22,000 or whatever it turns out to be in the mail next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday. So, so we so, would call, so, call your office and we would be wearing masks and gloves, I presume, and social distance. Yeah, and, and, and um, the other thing that we do is just as a practical matter, um, I kind of try to take people's temperature. There are some people that have health reasons they can't wear a mask full time, so we try to give them extra distance and set them up to be comfortable in the environment. So yeah, we would probably have a conversation about masks and you know what you, what you can and cannot do and how you want to do it, that kind of stuff. Most people in the office are wearing a mask, but we allow people at their duty station or desk if they're not around people and they're not engaged in a lot of public comment or public conversation to not wear if they're exceeding that six foot limit as well as just working at their own station in long distances from other people. So there's, there's just some practical stuff that we do. Uh, but yes, I think you're correct. Uh, Lots of hours at this point, it's really inserting. Later on, it, it probably will be flattening and opening and that kind of stuff at the ballots and getting them ready to run through the machine. So we're looking for help. Excellent. Thank you, Commissioner Howe. We do appreciate everything that you've done. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that on election day is the first Tuesday in um, November. <laughs> Tuesday Topics again, where we will hear from Carol Babcock with Topeka Jump. And Topeka Jump is going to talk with us about uh, their work on affordable housing with the city of Topeka. So I'll see you back here next month and uh, hopefully see you Tuesday at 11 to talk to, Barb, to Dr. Bob Beatty. Thank you. Thanks.